rockets, nuclear reactors, lasers, oh my. One of the most radioactive Cold War sites on the whole planet and definitely in the United States. All located just a few miles into the hills outside of LA. Most people have no clue they live so close to such a dangerous area near one of the most densely populated places in the whole United States. And no, this is not a conspiracy. Everything in this special two-part series is based on actual facts. So sit back and let's figure out why, when, and how this could possibly be a thing right here in the suburbs of LA and not in the Soviet Union. And how it crucially affects residents of the Simi and San Fernando Valley's health today. Backstories, ladies and gentlemen. Now, originally, I was planning to make a video about Box Canyon, a weird place in itself just outside of Chatsworth, where the Manson family and other weird cults started. And that led me to find out about the deformities and cancer of the place, and it was highly unusual, giving it that hills have eyes type of vibe to the whole place. Then I come to find out that the cultic motherhood is only like a couple miles away from the Santa Susana Field Laboratory of Horrors, which is an abandoned radioactive nuclear power and rocket site, which led me down a whole deeper rabbit hole in itself. We might eventually visit the Box Canyon episode later on, but when I saw this, I decided this was it. This is exactly what my channel was made for. The very story about the Santa Susana Field Laboratory, the Chernobyl right in my own backyard because I grew up in the San Fernando Valley, not too far from this whole place. And I've seen plenty of rockets being launched in my younger day as well as stories about there being a facility somewhere in the hills, but I never really knew exactly where and the media never, never talked about it. But why didn't the media talk about it? Well, we gotta start from the beginning. Shortly after World War II ended, the Cold War began. The North American Aviation Company would develop the Santa Susana Field Lab, which was slated as a U.S. government facility to develop the testing of nuclear reactors and powerful rockets for the military in the Santa Susana Hills between Los Angeles and Simi Valley in 1947 which they say at the time the surrounding suburbs were not nearly as populated, but it still had a suburban population just a few miles away, and to even build such a facility around any group of residents just a lack of care for the citizens, and today well over a half million people stay within 10 miles of the area, and even thousands stay just within 2 miles of the area. But hey, it's the government, we all know how they roll. The facility will conduct the Navajo Missile Project, which was a design to launch a nuclear weapon to the Soviet Union if need be since the Cold War just started and funding was spike in the 1950s as the Korean War started. The North American Aviation Company would eventually make the place known as Rocket Dime which consisted of three areas for rocket testing. There was also a fourth part that went to Atomics International for nuclear testing. And eventually in 1967, the Rockwell International Corporation bought it all. But as for the missile itself, it entered production in 1955 and ran into difficulties and was canceled in 1958 when the Crisis Corporation Redstone missile made more progress for V2 engines. However, Rocket Dyne's A5 engine proved to be more reliable than the Redstone one with liquid fuel to reach supersonic speeds and altitudes where the cruise missile was separating crews to its target. So they end up redesigning with the A5. This would directly lead to engines used to launch the Saturn 1 and Saturn 5 moon rockets used by NASA. So the rocket technology was innovative, despite the obvious dangers. And they would continue to test several other military rockets throughout the 50s. But in 1957 on an Atomics International site, they launched a sodium reactor experiment known as the SRE which was the first nuclear reactor in the United States to produce electrical power for the commercial power grid, which was powering the nearby city of Moore Park. The Susanna reactor started producing power early in November, and our cameras were focused on the town at 7.30 p.m. November 12, 1957, when for the first time in the United States, an entire community was illuminated by electricity generated by an atomic reactor. Enrico Fermi once looked at a reactor and said, wouldn't it be wonderful if it could cure the common cold? Here at Moore Park, a chain reaction that started with him washed the dishes and lit a book for a small boy to read. But only two years later, in July 1959, disaster would happen where 13 of the 43 fuel elements partially melted. The SRE's most troublesome run began July 12, 1959. By the next day, the power was rising for no apparent reason. 
the control rods failed to stop it. The reactor failed to shut itself down, so it was stopped or scrammed by hand. Reports show the operators did not know what was wrong, but that somehow they decided the power excursion had not affected the reactor adversely. So they started it up again. That would be unheard of in today's safety atmosphere. What does it mean? What were the potentialities there? Well, there were a lot of things that they didn't know about uh, what had caused the power excursion. They were measuring high radiation uh, release uh, levels within the uh, reactor building, and they didn't know why uh, that release was occurring. And essentially, they didn't know what the reactor core condition was, but for some reason, uh, they felt they needed to get back in operation. And this was caused by the tetralin, an oil-like fluid that leaked into the primary cooling system which was decomposed by high temperature sodium and it clogged the cooling system as reactors melted. The SRE was cooled not with water as most reactors now are, but with sodium, a liquid metal. This animation, on a government film never shown in public before, shows the sodium filling up the reactor going up between the radioactive fuel rods. When the fuel rods partially melted in 1959, the sodium absorbed the most dangerous of the materials produced by the accident, so they stayed in the reactor. But the operators did not know what had happened till some time after the accident occurred. The official reports almost The release of toxins into the atmosphere was underplayed and not talked about well into the 2000s. Release the gases out of the, re out of the reactor core. So this is the part I want to let everybody know about their stories about they had the tanks to take and release the, the gases into, but what happened is uh, during that day when they was trying to shut the reactor down, those tanks, those storage tanks, uh, were got, gotten filled up with trying to stop the reactor, to, and there they were. They had the tanks full. Everything was, they couldn't do anything. What do we do now? If we don't shut something down, it's going to blow up. And I was there to listen to all that was going on. And so what they had to do, they had to release the, the, uh, the nuclear radiation straight out of the reactor, out in the atmosphere. This has not been talked about, but I was there and I know it happened. It went out over the San Fernando Valley, went over the eastern end of Sami Valley. The winds were blowing in that direction. This might be a surprise to many out there, but that's what actually happened. Wow, unbelievable. Well, none of this surprised me knowing the history of the United States. Marvin J. Fox is nine there. So anyways, he went back to talking to the, to the men, when he, and then the men asked him, can we tell our families about it? Can we tell it? It went right over our own homes. We live in Chatsworth, Canoga Park, all those areas. Can we let our wives know the, what had happened? And the, and the three... Uh, men got together and uh, talked about it, and they come back to him and says, no, you cannot. No, I don't want anybody saying a word about it. We'll report what happened to the public in our own due time. And then he turned around and come over to me where I'm standing there taping up the door and all that, and he looked, got, got right up next to me like a, a sergeant in the military right in my face and says, you will not say a word about what happened here today. And, and he really got stern about it and scared me half to death uh, in the fashion he had done that. So here I am talking to you right now. I was not supposed to say a word. And this is, is something I have to say to all of you. It was something that's very important. <clears throat> Just to give me a second. Important to me to be able to let you know what actually happened. It's been with me 55 years. I've known this, but I, this is my first opportunity. And this, by the way, was the first ever power plant in the U.S. to experience a core meltdown. Then things got worse. When operators tried to unload the fuel, some rods broke apart, as shown by these animated drawings on a government training film, which has never been shown in public till now. Some rods were found to have swelled in the excessive heat and stuck in place. Ultimately, the entire reactor had to be vibrated in order to shake them loose. Twenty years later, opinions still differ on how the matter was handled. Uh, a slipshod operation, I guess, is the way I would describe it. Uh, and uh, uh, 
in just uh, uh, sort of a damn the torpedoes full speed ahead attitude, which is, uh, which is fine if you're fighting a war, I guess, but it is certainly not a way to run a reactor. For and it will be covered up for purposes. decades to come by the Atomics International, Rockwell, and the U.S. Department of Energy. I was interested in what I was saying, I just forgot, but this is who the, uh, was the ch uh, in charge of the SRE reactor, Marvin Fox, the one that talked to us and told us we couldn't say anything. Now, what they did, I want to just say real quickly, a lot of you know about a newspaper article that came out in the newspaper and said that what had happened was about a month later, and they brought it out, and it's, it's a lot different than what I just told you. So it gives you an idea what uh, uh, what they were thinking when they put that article in the paper. Marvin J. Fox or Pee Wee Herman? I could have never listened to that guy. What a stubborn dude. And that's an understatement. I'm going to talk about this gentleman right here. This was uh, Dr. Fox right here. He's wearing uh, regular street clothes. He's not even dressed down like all the rest of us are over here. He's, he was the person overseeing the, the, the SRE. He, would, he, he thought he was too good to be able to have to dress down like the rest of us. He thought he knew he was special. So, so that's why I put that uh, picture on there. He was, our, he was our boss right there, see? And surprisingly, he didn't actually die from cancer, but he would shortly die five years later of a heart attack, so maybe it must have been hard on him covering all that life and death information up, even if he was a hard ass about it. And this whole incident wouldn't even be spoke about at all to 20 years later. 20 years after the accident. Despite the seriousness of the accident, even Edward R. Murrow might have missed its importance at the time. The official news release claimed there was no indication of unsafe reactor conditions and newspapers treated the matter routinely. Local public safety officials weren't told much either. Today's the first time that I've heard of the 59 incident when you mentioned it a while ago. They even so-called repaired and restarted the reactor in 1960 to keep it running after the incident all the way to 1964. Uh, it did not appear to be a hazard to the public or to our employees. And uh, in retrospect, it wasn't a hazard to our employees or public, and we put the plant back on the line. The training film emphasizes the speed with which the reactor was put back online, but the operation took more than a year. Special grappling tools were engineered and constructed so radioactive garbage could be removed remotely under the eyes of television cameras since the reactor was too hot to open. A nuclear physicist who saw this film compared this to conducting heart surgery through the patient's nose. Enormous equipment had again to be designed and then built to rotate the 75-ton steel and cement plug that capped the reactor. It had to be moved each time a damaged fuel rod was to be taken out. That in itself was a delicate operation with special seals and containers required to make sure radioactive gas didn't leak out. Then the gigantic plug had to be rotated to the next rod so it could be taken out too. Fourteen months and millions of dollars later, the fuel had been shipped for burial in Beatty, Nevada. The SRE was operating again. But all this without any public notification. How dangerous might it have been? This was only one of many been. toxic incidents to come, with even a few prior ones happening before 1957. However, this is the single largest radioactive incident in U.S. history and the third largest of all time. It released 10,000 curries of radioactive gases, also an estimated amount of 1,300 but curries of iodine. There was always a chance that if fuel melting had proceeded unchecked, that it would have been released into the surrounding area, especially iodine and strontium. The iodine and strontium are very dangerous because the iodine goes to the thyroid glands of young children, causing thyroid cancer and the uh, strontium goes to the bones of growing children causing leukemia. And it affected workers and residents in the area for decades to come with a 0 0.099 milliram reading in the area which we'll touch more on in part two. Marvin J. Fox said I want you guys to take and start restart the reactor up. We want to find out what caused the reactor to go down and, and uh, so he gave us an assignment that we had to restart the reactor. And it was a very scary thing. I was on that crew. I was right there. I did, uh, and I was part of the crew that restarted it. And the reason he wanted to restart it was to, to find out what caused it, like I'd said. 
So what they did, they took for two weeks, like it's been advertised, been said for, you've heard it a hundred times maybe, uh, ran it, why did we start it and do all this? It was a very foolish thing. We was told to do it by the boss man. He was, he over, and we uh, went by what we was told to do and we scared us to death. We started up and it ran. What they do every 24 hours roughly, they would take and uh, shut down the reactor and then restart it again until they figured out for sure that it was that pump that was the cause of it. And every time they shut the reactor down, more radiation was released from the reactor at, uh, out into the atmosphere. It could have been uh, towards Sami Valley, could have been towards Topanga Canyon, it could be, uh, I can't tell you which way it went, but it, each time they had to release, release uh, radiation. Like I said, they said no word to the public at the time, and that went unspoken for decades. And this guy, Wayne Myers, was still lying years later. Certainly people were following that reactor all the time. Uh, it did not appear to be a hazard to the public or to our employees. And uh, in retrospect, it wasn't a hazard to our employees or public. And we put the plant back on the line. But the reason for looking at old accidents, like the one at the SRE, is to get perspective on new controversies. Unit 4 has learned that there is controversy within the government itself right now. Now, I'm sure he knows what happened and all, and this was just for saving face, but he actually died just last year in 2020, so he clearly wasn't affected by this. And honestly, I don't think he visited the site much since he was a jet mechanic in the Air Force at the time of the incident. In the 60s and 70s, the toxic waste would lead to sodium open-air burn pits. And yeah, it's just as crazy as it sounds. Some <clears throat> recollection uh, that you wanted to pass on regarding the sodium burn pit. Oh, yes. Well, uh, for tell those... What, tell people what that was, first of all. Okay, it was a uh, pit where, uh, like a small lake, and they took the uh, various chemicals, and especially sodium and NAC. NAC and sodium are both, both used primarily for the coolants in the primary cooling system of reactors, it, it disperses the heat. So I mentioned earlier the lab was split into four areas. The first three were all for rocket testing, but the fourth, that's where the most nuclear activity was happening. And that's where they would develop these sodium open air burn pits to clean metallic sodium components, burn lab trash and liquid waste. You told me once that as dangerous as the reactors were, there were more dangerous facilities on the property. Uh, what in particular? Well, we had several. The one that comes to mind to me is the uh, hot cell, which makes this, uh, it's even, I think, worse in many uh, um, instances because at the hot cell, they dissected fuel elements, irradiated fuel elements there. And uh, so when you're doing that... Because uh, apparently other reactors will melt. Yeah, Rocket Dyna Atomics International workers would actually toss barrels of sodium into water from pools and fire guns at the containers. Well, they would uh, take this used neck after it was removed from the reactor out, put it in drums, 55-gallon drums, take it to the sodium burn pit, uh, put it in a small rowboat, uh, one drum at a time, and uh, row it out to the center of the lake, push the drum in the water, and then get row back and get behind the coverage of uh, uh, a blockhouse. And they would shoot the drum uh, with a 30 odd six rifle, therefore allowing the water to seep into the drum. And when water comes in contact with NAC or sodium, it's, it's a very uh, serious explosion. And this is the way that they, allowed, they burned off this waste material as well as other chemicals and so on. So this burning was in the open air overlooking Simi Absolutely. Valley. And Absolutely. The smoke would travel all over the complex up there, including Rocketdyne and uh, the Atomics International Complex, and it would travel uh, into Simi Valley as well as the San Fernando Valley. Which sounds completely insane, but I don't think they knew too much about the dangers of radiation at the time. A representative from Rocketdyne attended their homeowners association meeting. Oh, there was nothing to worry about. You know, you'd get more, more radiation if you flew to Denver. You also, we were told, you'd get more um, radiation sleeping next to your husband. Yeah. Or eating a banana. Or maybe they did and just didn't care because they had a team of lawyers. 
But eventually 660 tons of radioactive soil and debris would have to be excavated from the pits and trucked to a nuclear dump in Nevada or Utah. And sometimes even further, and with all that being said, they actually transport all these radioactive materials casually through the public streets. About 25 tons of the highly radioactive Hallam reactor fuel was shipped to Atomics International in a truck that looked something like this. It came one ton at a time over two and a half years. At each time the truck brought a ton here, it took another ton back to complete the reprocessing at Savannah River. 25 round trips across the country, 50 crossings in all, down the road to Topanga Canyon Boulevard. The Department of Energy cannot reveal the exact route, but a spokesman told us to figure it took the logical freeways. That means down the Ventura, through the valley to the Golden State, through downtown Los Angeles to Interstate 10 and east, back and forth, a ton at a time, for two and a half years. Come on now, that's just absurd. And the lack of caution and responsibility just keeps getting worse. It's like these guys were children instead of scientists. The fuel that was uh, built to, for our SNAP reactors, that's my, uh, that's my connection with the bird cages. Fuel was manufactured down at the DeSoto plant at 8900 DeSoto Canoga Park. That's where they built the fuel elements for the various SNAP reactors. Um, they would send these fuel elements up to Santa Susana for low uh, testing, various types of um, low yield testing, I think is the word for it. Um, and when they would ship the fuel up to Santa Susana, it went down the public roadways, down what, uh, uh, Devonshire, and then down Topanga, and then up the hill. Well, um, <clears throat> on some of the bird cages that we found, we, we smeared them and checked them when they came in. We found little metal shavings on the exterior of these um, bird cages, and the uh, little metal shavings turned out to be uh, enriched uranium, or at least that's what we thought. They looked like a little metal shaving that you'd see in a shop. And uh, one day I was doing my job and looking around, and I found all these metal shavings on the uh, exterior of the bird cages. And I took them back to the lab and counted them, and they were just extremely hot. Uh, so what you got to ask yourself is how much contamination was spread from uh, the DeSoto headquarters building uh, up to Santa Susana uh, on the roadway, the public roadway. And then on, uh, at various uh, sites on the hill, how many people got it in their shoes, got it on their hands, and didn't even realize That's it? That's just scary. And even though this was before my time, I've driven down those streets hundreds of times. Just to think at a level of incompetence, it's hard to grasp. Is it a good idea to have them going through the freeways in the middle of Los Angeles? Uh, there's always a better way to transport radioactive material if we could find a spot that was totally isolated. The report says that out of the 27 men who worked in this sodium pit section, 22 of them developed cancer. If there had been somebody there, what harm could those gases have done? Your lung tissue is very sensitive to radiation. The inhalation dose is 10 times the skin dose. And so noble gases uh, are very penetrating. They can go right through a gas mask. They can go through activated charcoal. They will bathe the lungs with beta radiation and gamma radiation and can cause cancer in the lung tissue. Of course, they are also very rapidly dispersed because they are noble gas. There was also reports that when the men came home and kissed their wives, they would burn the lips of their wives with the chemicals they brought home from the they job. Taking it home, uh, you can do that very easily because with the SRE reactor, just my experience, 24-7 uh, radiation was coming out of that reactor going all over the hill. It could be the ones in Rockadine. It could be anywhere on the hill. You was being exposed every day you was there because with the SRE reactor, with the, t the type of works going on, no containment building to hold it in, you, you went home with it on you. So that's what my wife worries about too. Yeah, I'd like to com could I comment on that? Um, in my experience with the workers, a lot of them were told when they went home to wash their clothes separately or bury them in the backyard. Um, also, I knew some workers at the plutonium building after they had a large explosion and uh, they went home in their clothes and the Atomic Energy Commission had to go in and test their house and for, um, for plutonium. So it did. It went. It was honest. Now all this sounds incredibly irresponsible by those in charge. The responsibility would actually continue well into the 90s. 
The rocket nine would illegally store explosive materials and continue the burning well after they lost their license to do that in 1982. Then eventually two men in 94 would actually die in an open pit explosion. And that would finally lead to the FBI investigation on Rockwell, where the company would take a plea agreement and pay out 6.5 million in fines, and three Rocket Dine officials would plead guilty to charges in 2004. And in part two, I'll get to what actually happened after the federal lawsuit and the new owners. Also, I'll dive more into the cleanup efforts, community lawsuits, and modern day effects of the radiation, which once again would spread due to the 2018 Woosley Canyon fire, as if the area wasn't contaminated enough. So stay tuned. Backstories, ladies and gentlemen.